This episode contains material that might be triggering for some. If you need to stop the podcast at any time to take care of yourself, please do so. If you need support, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988. Dialectical Behavior Therapy was created in the 1980s by Marsha Linehan in Seattle, Washington. Today, DBT is taught all over the world. We're two therapists who believe everyone can benefit from DBT skills. I'm Kate. I'm Michelle. And And this this is is DBT and Me. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Oh, boy. We have a topic today (laughs) for a skill that Kate and I... When did you find out about this skill? A week ago? I think it was... I was going to say, like, a week, week and a half ago, I think. Something Something like like that. that. Because I didn't talk to you about it until we got together to podcast last time. And I was like, I have to tell you this thing. Yes. How do we not know about this skill? (laughs) Wait. Kate stumbled upon the skill. No one has heard of it. None of Mm -hmm. the people I've asked so far have heard of it, but it's in the book. It's there. It is. It's in the book. Basically, we're going to be talking about a skill today called Alternate Rebellion. And Kate's right. If you are also a fellow DBT practitioner like us and you're going, what are the two of you talking about? Kate's not wrong. It is indeed in the manual. And it's in the part of the manual that talks specifically about skills for struggling with addiction. So there's one handout that talks about this concept, but we looked into it after Kate heard the term and we really liked it. So we wanted to record on it. And possibly that we haven't sorted this out yet. You may notice in some upcoming episodes, we might dive more into that section of the DBT manual because there's actually quite a bit of good stuff there that we haven't ever touched on because we don't, in our groups, talk specifically about addiction and DBT for addiction. So we just gloss over that whole section of the DBT manual. But it turns out there's more skills in there Whoops. that we didn't know existed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was so flabbergasted anyway. Me too. <laughs> I didn't believe it either at first, but lo and behold, it is a skill. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before I dive into talking about what the skill is, we're going to start off with self promotion stuff. And that includes shouting out two new patrons. So we are shouting out today Castle and Misty. So thank you, both of you, for becoming patrons. Thank you. We love it. And if you want to become a patron like them, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash dbtandme. Uh, We'd love it if you checked out our Etsy shop if you haven't already. And you can do that by going to etsy.com slash shop slash dbtandme. Admittedly, we have a lot of mugs. We know it's not mug season right now. But you can get prepared for the fall months. It's always mug season. It's always mug season. It feels that way to me, at least. So you can check out our Etsy shop. I drink tea every morning. It's always mug season. Oh, see, perfect. And you're not alone in that, I'm sure. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, we would love it if you left us a rating and or a review. Those mean a lot to us. And if you have questions about the episode or future topic ideas, maybe you know of other DBT skills we haven't touched on yet that we're unaware of, you can email us at dbtandmepodcast at gmail.com. Finally, the last thing I'll say before we dive into the topic is that if you have not already, you can also check out our second podcast, the couch and the chair, where we talk about all things that are not DBT. Actually, though, ironically, the thing that I'm realizing about today, as I mentioned the couch and the chair, is that the format that we have for this episode is pretty much identical to how we record those episodes for that podcast, which is that we're each going to be sharing personally about how we see this skill showing up in our lives. And then we're going to switch gears into talking about tips and suggestions for how to do it. And that's what we do in the couch and the chair. We 
share personally on a topic and then we share professionally, I guess you could say. So that's an interesting similarity today with what we're recording. But now I'll dive in to what (laughs) the heck is alternate rebellion? What are we talking about? So even though this is in the DBT manual, it was mentioned on one handout only. So I'm going to give you literally all the information verbatim of what was said in the manual about what this skill is. So what it says is that when addictive behaviors are a way to rebel against authority, conventions, and the boredom of not breaking rules or laws, try alternate rebellion. Alternate rebellion replaces destructive rebellion and keeps you on a path to your goals. So we want to be really clear, too, because sometimes we do this with DBT where we know how the skill is meant to be used. But then when we talk about it with all of you, we also talk about ways that you can expand upon it and really take it and hopefully find it useful out of the specific context that DBT intended it for. So we want to be super transparent and open about how this skill was designed specifically for if you're struggling with addiction. As it just said in that definition there, that you would be using this skill if you recognize for yourself that you turn to an addictive behavior as a way to rebel. And this is to give you a different path. It's maybe almost in a weird way. I don't know if you agree with this, Kate, but I'm conceptualizing it as like some kind of opposite action. Oh, it, I Maybe see it that. has that kind of flavor to it a little bit. So if you're normally... Not this, but this instead. <laughs> yes, exactly. If you're normally rebelling against authority by doing something illegal, you can switch to doing some things that are healthy, legal, don't hurt anybody else, <laughs> cause destruction in any way, that kind of a thing. So that's the definition there. And then on the handout in the manual, it gave a checklist of examples for how you could do this. So I'm just going to quickly read through these and then you're going to hopefully get a better sense of how this can look as we dive into our shares and start thinking about how this could look for you. So examples are shaving your head, wearing crazy underwear, wearing unmatched shoes, having secret thoughts, expressing unpopular views, doing random acts of kindness, vacationing with your family at a nudist colony, writing a letter saying exactly what you want to, dyeing your hair a wild color, getting a tattoo or body piercing, wearing clothes inside out, not bathing for a week, printing a slogan on a t-shirt, painting your face, dressing up or dressing down, where doing so is unexpected. So I just went through those very quickly, but it hopefully gives you a taste, a little flavor of what we're talking about. And we believe, and this is why we're talking about this skill out of just talking about it in the context of addiction, we actually think that just doing those things (laughs) that I just went over very quickly, doing those things can actually just have a lot of benefit for your mental health as a whole, even if you're not doing them for the reason of, hey, I'm struggling with an addictive behavior and I'm looking for a a healthy way to rebel, you can, we think, do these things and find benefits from doing them, even if addiction is not something that you're struggling with. So as a whole, we think this, this skill could be helpful for lots of different things, and that will hopefully become apparent as we go through and talk about how we see this showing up in our lives personally, and then also when we get to our part of discussing suggestions. So I don't know, Kate, if there's anything you want to add on so far with what I've said about it or your comprehension of this skill as we're very new to learning it. (laughs) (laughs) I know it's fun. I feel like a newbie in my own right here, which I don't normally. Um, No, I think you did a good job just reminding everybody that we're coming from it from a different place. I mean, mine might be more about act. I don't want to say actual, about mental health issues. And yours Mm -hmm. might be a little bit more like life maintenance. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, while they're both, you know, along our usual spectrum of uh, experience, none of us are bringing the originally intended experience uh, to the picture. So just just a reminder about that. Mm -hmm. Um, Before I launch into my uh, sharing, I want to give two disclaimers. One is it's finally become hot season. Uh, 90 in degrees Washington. 
I know. Uh, oh, it, well, useless piece of trivia to most people most of the time, but they're uh, making it uh, a new building code that new apartments and condos at least have to have air pumps starting in July um, because the climate is changing here in Washington. So that's fun. Um, <laughs> wish I had one. <laughs> what I do have, though, is a fan, which is where that whole disclaimer thing started. Uh, if you guys can hear the whirring of the fan, I apologize, but I'm not turning it off. Uh, and the other thing is I'm sick. I'm almost a week and a half sick now. I'm very tired of being sick. Uh, but <clears throat> like that, if I will, you hear me clearing my throat and, or if I sound strange, uh, that's because I feel like death. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I like this. So when I was, uh, first, I guess exposed to the skill. That's a weird way of uh, framing it. A friend sent me a meme uh, that was like uh, two different memes of Barbies. And it's like, this Barbie is practicing. And it's like a couple of different DBT skills. And the first one was like spa Barbie or something. And it said that she was practicing self-soothe with the five senses. Uh, and then there was a picture of a Barbie with like 17 different colors of hair. Uh, and it says, this Barbie is practicing the alternate rebellion DBT skill. And I'm like, the fuck now? Wait, you that's say? how you like, found it? I didn't hear yes. that story. <laughs> yes, in a meme. And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not a DBT skill. I know all the DBT skills, I said, with hubris. Because I was wrong. <laughs> it was real. <laughs> I absolutely thought someone was making shit up to make a meme. <laughs> anyway, uh... <laughs> But after getting over the what the fuck, uh, do, how do I, the world has moved. Um, there's a DBT skill I don't know. Uh, because I was never exposed to it, even when I went through it when I was a teenager. Um, probably because I wasn't dealing with addiction issues, right? Well, and I think this one was new to the second edition and we were still yes. on first edition when I went through as a client, mm -hmm. actually, now that I think about it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, when, I, when I finally saw it and uh, read the admittedly lacking a uh, description of what alternate rebellion is. My initial thought was that's my entire life. <laughs> like, <coughs> I feel a little bit like uh, the, a living embodiment of this skill in many ways, uh, which is kind of fun. Who, who knew? I mean, I already knew I practiced DBT skills, but I practiced the shit out of this one <laughs> over the course of my life without ever having any idea I was being so skillful. Um, so like some of the things, and this is not, this is not an exhaustive list. I would just like to make that clear. This was just sitting down uh, this morning and off the top of my heading, I uh, was like, well, what are times that I have practiced this skill or done something that would count? Uh, and so let's say things I thought about were shaving my head entirely uh, at like 1130 at night, I think the first time. Um, I was like, I must cut my hair. And I drove around until I found a drugstore that was open that had a razor so I could do it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> dyeing my hair, which amusingly enough right now, I'm both uh, by halves. I have half my head is shaved and the other half is dyed wild colors. So I've got both of those going for me in the moment. Um, I've got 18 or 19 tattoos. Don't judge me that I don't know that number for sure. Um, piercings that I continue to get, even though my body likes to reject my favorite kind of piercing on a very regular basis. I just keep getting it in different parts of my body because God damn it. One day my body will accept it. Um, I have worn formal wear to the movies and to Denny's and other such places that uh, it's not appropriate. Uh, I have dressed quote unquote too sexy for similar things, right? Uh, dressing like you're going out clubbing when you're not. Um, I've gone out in public uh, wearing a leash, uh, walking mostly naked through Seattle at Pride. Well, after Pride and away from Pride, which was why I was such an act of rebellion um, in that particular case. Uh, let's see. Um, taking sneaky naked pictures in the park, driving too fast, um, lying to get out of work. While I do have migraines, I'm afraid to tell every boss I've ever had that I've absolutely lied about having a migraine to get out of work. <clears throat> I have. 
It only stopped once I was my only boss. I cannot lie to myself about migraines. <laughs> I have to find other excuses to take days off now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, gosh, uh, riding on the hood of the car naked after skinny dipping so I could dry off. Um, letting uh, bruises that I'd gotten in BDSM uh, show while I was out in public instead of covering them up. Uh, gosh, I don't know. I think that's all of the things. Right, but not all the things, just all the things I wrote down, right? This is this is something that I have, yeah, actively engaged in for most of my existence that I can recall. Now, I do want to separate out that some of the actions that I mentioned there in that list were deliberate actions that I was taking for my mental health, right? Were, I would say, practicing a skill... And I knew it was a skillful thing I was doing. I just didn't have the words alternate rebellion uh, to put onto it. But <clears throat> times when I might be, um, yeah, having other impulsive urges, right? I don't have any classic uh, substance use issues, but self-harm um, or maybe, you know, inter interpersonally destructive interactions uh, with other people, uh, right? Or, you know, just impulsively doing things that are maybe not a great plan for my mental, emotional, physical, or financial health somewhere in there. Uh, and instead, doing one of the things on this list, right? I have absolutely shaved my head as a mental health thing. I have absolutely done the, you know, going out in public um, dressed oddly uh, for the circumstances, right? Like a lot of these things were things I was doing to lean in um, to something that was a better alternative Right. Alternate rebellion. Um, a little bit. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Michelle? Uh, re harm reduction. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't thought about it until just now, but it reminds me a little bit of like harm reduction mentality. Right. Like, yeah, I don't know. Writing a letter that says everything you want to might have some effects, especially if you end up giving it to a person. Um, but, you know, it's also probably better than uh, the thing you're trying to avoid. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so really looking at where can I let this energy free into my life uh, safely, as opposed to um, turning to unhealthy or uncomfortable, you know, yeah, unhealthy means of accomplishing the same ends. <clears throat> well, and I don't know if this is accurate or not. This is just maybe how I'm reading into some of these things or interpreting them as far as how they play into your mental health. And yeah. I could be way off base here, <laughs> potentially. But for some of these things for you, was this a way of you just really being authentic? Of being like, this is me. Fuck what anybody thinks. Like, yeah, I'm going to wear formal wear out if I want to. Or I'm going to dress really sexy for this if I want to. And like, this is me showing up and being fully myself and kind of embracing who I am rather than trying to hide who I am and put myself in a box. And if that's a big way that it benefited your mental health too, was that you were just really stepping into you by doing yeah. a lot of these things. And of course, I mean, I, I struggle to think of things that could be more beneficial for our mental health than trying to just be authentically ourselves. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true, right? It's like trying to find ways to express myself and assert and celebrate like ways that I'm different, mm -hmm, um, exactly, which was something yeah. that I was, you know, bullied for a lot growing up. And so I think that, yeah, getting a lot of negative repercussions made me feel all the more, right, rebellious. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> you can't bully me out of being myself, right? Like, I am still this person no matter how much of an asshole you are. Um, and so, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it was funny because I, I think I worked myself around to thinking, well, these things don't count as really using the skill all the way wrapped around to, well, actually, I think it probably still counts in its own way. I mean, again, mm -hmm. we, as we already owned, we are expanding the shit out of this skill, like just out yeah. of the box. Like, like just immediately, <laughs> we are... Yeah already creating a lot of elbow room within this skill. Um, and I think within the space that we're making, um, the context that we're talking about, about like celebrating authenticity um, and being like unapologetically yourself is an act of rebellion mm -hmm. and uh, absolutely can count in that way. So, <clears throat> so yeah, I think 
the things that it does for me are help me avoid like self-harm or other destructive like interpersonal interactions things like that and definitely helps me feel grounded right in my sense of self and in my identity um which is something that i can lose sight of sometimes so it definitely helps like yeah keep me grounded in myself to to act in these ways um oh i almost said it haha <laughs> Do not say it. Uh, no! <laughs> I just I'll say said it. it again. So, yeah. There we go. Your turn. <laughs> okay. I mean, I guess my disclaimer before I start sharing with any of you who have listened to the podcast for a long time already know Kate and I are very different people with very different life experiences. <laughs> and I think that will be especially Putting highlighted. It mildly. <laughs> yes, to put it mildly. <clears throat> and you're really going to see that in talking about this skill. Because I've never dyed my hair. <laughs> That's just one example. Um, I have one tattoo and didn't get it for a very long time in my life. Um, but basically, I mean... Like with many things, we think there's a lot of strength and a lot of benefits to our differences because we know we have really diverse listeners and we know that we have listeners who really relate to Kate and have a lot in common with Kate and listeners who maybe relate more to me and have more in common with me. And so if you were listening to that list that I read at the beginning or listening to Kate talk and you're like, I haven't <laughs> done any of those things, then the thought of doing those things makes me shudder and... There's no way I'm going to practice this skill. Listen up to what I'm about to say, because you need this skill. <laughs> I need alternate rebellion in my life because it doesn't come, I guess you could say, as naturally to me as say it does to Kate. But it's really interesting, actually, Kate, I'll add this on before I start talking more. When you said that for yourself, when you first learned about this skill, you thought, that's your entire life. The first thing yeah. that I thought when I read this skill, especially those checkboxes, I was like, Kate, 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 Kate. <laughs> I thought the same <laughs> thing about you. I was just like, this skill is Kate. Kate is this skill. <laughs> well, and, I love that. At yeah. least we're consistent in our opinion. <laughs> oh, yeah. It fits for you perfectly. And, you know, then it gets I mean, me going thinking, barefoot. Okay. How did I not mention that one? Hmm? Oh my gosh. How did I not mention going barefoot for 23 years? That was the first <laughs> thing I thought of. I was like, oh, Kate being barefoot. That's yeah, it's so, it's so much a part of my life. I didn't even think about it as a thing. <laughs> like, yeah, because it was the first thing it's just I thought me. of with you. It just is. Yes, exactly. I mean, of course, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's funny that I totally glossed over that one. Ah, uh -huh. Yeah, because that's, that's a perfect example of it. So when we look at me and my life and this skill, it's going to look different. Definitely. And also, like I just said a moment ago, for those of you who are like me, who are a little more inside the box, you follow the rules, you play nice, we are the ones who need this skill more than anyone. So I'm sh I know I've talked about this in some way, shape, or form throughout the podcast, but I've been a rule follower all my life, or maybe I haven't really explicitly talked about it and you all can just sense it from me. I, I do what's expected of me under pretty much any and all circumstances. And where this comes from, I was actually planning to mention this example uh, later on when talking about suggestions and tips for how to use this skill, but I'll mention it now. A good example of this to give you all a sense of how I was raised, I was never allowed to walk outside barefoot. As a child, my mom was worried wow. I would step on a piece of glass. <laughs> we <laughs> did admittedly have a lot of broken glass in our backyard from the people who lived in who lived here before us, but I was never allowed to walk outside barefoot. When my mom would bake, you know, and it would come time to, there's raw cookie dough. I was not allowed to eat the raw cookie dough. Travesty. Yes, it is indeed. And I grew up with kind of these sometimes unspoken, sometimes very spoken expectations that everything had a right and a wrong way. And I think as a function of my mom's own anxiety, there were a lot of limitations placed on me 
there were a lot of movies I wasn't allowed to watch when I was growing up. I remember that specifically, that basically all of my classmates or friends at school would have seen a movie, but not me. And my mom wouldn't allow me to because she didn't think it was appropriate. <laughs> a lot of places I wasn't allowed to go. There were a lot of things that I couldn't do. And I was given this message that it was a positive trait to not do those things and to do what was expected of you. And it saved me a whole lot of grief with my mom. I didn't want to fight battles with her about trying to do the things that she didn't want me to do. It was just easier to do what was expected of me. And I was heavily praised when I was in school by all my teachers. You know, I was a very good student. I was well behaved in class. It just became a part of my identity in ways that I didn't consciously make it part of my identity, but it was just what I was known for. I was known for being quote unquote, a good girl by doing what other people wanted me to do. So I really didn't start breaking the rules until I, well, I mean, maybe like most people, many people probably start breaking rules earlier than this, but towards, I don't know, 16, 17, Roughly that time of my life coincides with when I had my hip injury and I stopped dancing. I didn't really have time <laughs> to do much else prior to that. I went to school and I went to ballet class and that was my life. But now I had more time on my hands because I wasn't going to ballet six days a week. And rule breaking started to set in. Um, part of it was because I started having a crush on a guy that I worked with who wound up to go on to become my partner for eight years. And uh, if you want to talk about who was a rebel, he was. <laughs> he had tattoos. He had piercings. He smoked. He drank, though he wasn't 21. All of these things, right? <laughs> he was the quote unquote bad boy. And there you have it. So I was, I was attracted to him. And I can see now the part of why I was attracted to him was because my own little inner rebel was like, oh, I wish I could be like that. <laughs> so it was attractive to me to find somebody who was embracing and doing all these things that I didn't have the courage to do because I was too scared of what would happen if I broke the rules. But really, I attribute it even more so um, from that crush that I had on him. I attribute my rule breaking to a friend who I met when I was not dancing ballet anymore, but I joined a different dance group. We were doing different styles of dance and we became friends. And I don't know what the best way I can think of to put it is that something like cracked within me, something broke. And I started breaking rules because he was so nonchalant about breaking them. There was one day he didn't have a car. I did. I had my license at the time. So I was driving myself to and from these dance classes. And he asked if I could give him a ride home. And I said, sure. I didn't mind. He was on my way back home. And he asked if he could drive my car. Now, let me make something very clear. This car was technically my parents' car. <laughs> it's not my car. <laughs> but it was the car that I drove. This friend didn't have his license. He was a couple years younger than me, but he asked if he could drive my car. And for whatever reason, one day I said yes. And one could say the rest is history. But so began my alternate rebellion phase, which went on for a number of years. I, I would have considered this friend my best friend. Honestly, he became my best friend for about five years, maybe a little longer. So for five years... I practiced a fair amount of alternate rebellion by letting him drive my car every chance we got, which let me tell you, did he eventually wreck my car? Yes, he did. Did I lie about it to my parents and say I was the driver? Yes, I did. They still don't know to this day that he was the one who <laughs> crashed the car. <laughs> I said it was me. Um, we, we would just hang out all hours of the day and night and I'm only briefly capturing what we did here. I bought him cigarettes. Um, one time we were walking through the mall parking lot and there was a random beer bottle. And I never would have done this if I hadn't been with him. But I took a swig out of it 
which was a terrible Ooh. decision. I got a staph infection in my throat, worst throat pain of my life. Don't drink out of random beer bottles, everybody, when you're out and about. But I just <laughs> did because I didn't think when I was with him. We were out one night and we climbed on the roof of a school. I don't know why. We drove around naked in Seattle. <laughs> I, I don't know what it was about him, but I got brave and I started doing things that one, I would have never, ever done at a certain point in my life, but things that kind of scared me, but then I did them and it was like this thrill and this rush. And it was kind of like a high to, to do these things. And eventually, um, I, I lost that friendship. It just kind of fizzled out. Um, he came briefly back into my life two years later and I was ecstatic to have him back in my life. And then it just fizzled out again. And now I haven't seen or talked to him in over 10 years. And sometimes I struggle with, do I miss him or do I miss these experiences that I had with him? Because I have not been nearly as rebellious ever since. It felt like it was this part of me that was awakened, but like it could only be there when I was with him. Then you put me back to being on my own and I didn't know how to capture this little rebel inside of me <laughs> that came out pretty much at least once a week for five years when I would hang out with him. Now what? Where did she go? And I miss her. I miss that time of my life. And so now you fast forward and I'm a mom, I'm a business owner, I'm adulting in a way that I wasn't. I mean, I'm trying to think of about how old I was when he and I last had contact with each other. I mean, like I said, it was over 10 years ago. So all of this time of my life was like late teens, early 20s. So the the perfect age for rebellion as a whole when most people tend to rebel and it's very developmentally appropriate to rebel when you're in your late teens and early 20s but i'm not anymore i'm in my mid 30s i'm about to be 34 next month and i have a shit ton of responsibilities on my plate so i wanted to really speak to those of you who are maybe like me in the sense of you grew up always doing what was expected of you. And now you find yourself in adulthood and maybe you went through a period of time in your life like I did and then it stopped. Or maybe you never went through a period of time like that and you're craving it. Cause I certainly was when he came into my life. That's why I went with it so easily because I'd been wanting it all along. And then, you know, I started dating eventually the guy I had a crush on and you know, that was when I started drinking and I was under 21. And, you know, I started doing all these things that were rule breaking as well with him. Um, but what does it look like when you're, I guess you could say, a typical adult, when we have to do adulting things and how do we bring in alternate rebellion? And I mean, I think that list that the DBT manual had is a good list of things that you can you can do pretty pretty simply and easily but I know that some of those things may feel like a stretch and so I wanted to talk about some ways that I do use alternate rebellion with what my current life circumstances are because it looks very different from how I did it then <laughs> how does it look now for me and this is like a very mild light dose of alternate rebellion but this may be what it looks like for some of you and this may feel like some <clears throat> accessible ways to do it. So the biggest way that I see this show up in my life is because I'm the person who struggles to prioritize play over work. I always choose work first with anything. So if I have, Kate just made a face because she's like, what the hell? <laughs> um, but if I have 30 Shudder. minutes free... What do I do? I look around and I'm like, well, the dishes need to get done. My son's toys need to be picked up. Oh, I need to respond to that work email. That's literally actually what I did when I had 30 minutes free earlier today. I did the dishes. I responded to a work email. I picked up my son's toys. I didn't do anything for me. I didn't do anything that would fall under the category of play. I did work. And that's what I do 
all the time, just as I move through the world. I'm always doing work stuff. So where I see myself practicing alternate rebellion the most or how it looks really accessible and applicable to my current life circumstances is that I'm practicing alternate rebellion any time that I basically say, fuck work, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's me practicing alternate rebellion. And it typically doesn't look like anything that extreme, you guys. Like, this is pretty simple stuff that for some of you may feel like breathing. You do this stuff all the time. And for others of you may feel very foreign and very uncomfortable like it does for me. But one way that I catch this sometimes is when I try to sleep in a little bit. I don't let myself sleep in that often because there's always things to do. But when I let myself sleep in, even just by pressing snooze one extra time, that's a little bit of alternate rebellion where I'm like, screw the dishes that I know are in the sink and I didn't get done last night. Click, I'm sleeping 15 more minutes. So I see it show up like that, um, especially since becoming a parent because I get so little time to myself. Oh, I'm definitely staying up late watching shows and eating junk food on a regular basis. And I'm well aware that I'm like, I could go to bed and try to get eight hours of sleep, but I don't want to. <laughs> I would rather stay up and eat this candy <laughs> and watch a show for 30 minutes. I don't care. Fuck sleep. I've definitely had that be the tone of my thoughts more than once. Um, I liked that some of the suggestions for this involve what you wear. And Kate, you talked about that too for yourself, that you've definitely seen it show up in clothing choices, practicing alternate rebellion. Again, oh yeah, mine's on the mild side, but if I like dress a little <laughs> more casual for work, it actually felt really rebellious the first time. I knew I just had all telehealth clients. Nobody was coming into the office, but I wore like tennis shoes to my office. And the reason why that felt a little rebellious was because I have subletters and they have their clients. And so I was like, people are going to think <laughs> Kate's giving me a look. I'm telling you, it felt what rebellious kind of shoes to me. What shoes do you normally wear? Like dress shoes, like flats. I don't just wear I tennis shoes no when idea. I'm working most of the time. I had no idea. Yeah. And I want to put off oh, this professional job, impression to people. Yeah, the, the of people course, who the are people renting subletting. my office. Yeah, and, that makes sense. Yeah, but nope, that definitely felt rebellious the first time. And then I was like, I'm going to wear tennis shoes all the time when I'm not seeing in-person clients. Maybe I'll work up to eventually wearing them with my in-person clients too. We'll see. But definitely trying to make more casual clothing choices, even if, again, it's not super, super casual. Just those little baby steps feel like a little bit of an act of rebellion to me. Um, Kate, the only one that we overlap on is speeding. You mentioned that you will sometimes drive too fast. Oh. <laughs> I drive too yep. fast all the time. And I have had multiple speeding tickets. And whenever my husband points it out to me, because he very much follows the speed limit at all times, and he's like, you're speeding. It just makes me want to go faster. <laughs> I'm like, screw you. I'm in the driver's seat. I will drive how fast I want. I don't care if I get a ticket. I'm not going to get a ticket. Um, so definitely when it comes to driving, um, some alternate rebellion shows up for me. Or sometimes, like the other night I caught myself, I was, wanting, I was taking a shower after my son was asleep. And I really just wanted to listen to some music, like, pretty loudly. And there was a part of me that was like, no, 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 don't do that. You're going to wake him up. And then I was like, whatever. I was like, you know what? If he wakes up, <laughs> my husband can deal with him because he was just downstairs. I want to listen to my music. I want to sing. And I can sing pretty loudly when I want to. And I did it. And it did feel a little rebellious because I was tossing aside that thought of like, but what if he wakes up? Just being like, this is what I want to do. So as you can see, the way that alternate rebellion looks for me looks very different than it does <clears throat> for Kate. But whenever I can find those times where I'm doing something that prioritizes me and what I want over what might be expected or what I think other people want from me, that's when I'm practicing alternate rebellion. And... The benefits that I get from this, I think, are huge. And that's why I've said it more than once now where I'm like, guys, if you're listening and you're like me and you're a rule follower, do this skill. Find little ways in your life to do this skill because what I get from it when I am rebelling a little bit is that 
I really feel like a sense of control, but it also brings me great joy. You better believe that I was happier taking that shower the other night, listening to my music and singing than I would have been if I was like, no, no, just shower quietly. Don't risk waking Noah up. It felt so much better <laughs> to sing and just be me for a little bit. And the other thing that, again, I don't do enough, we need breaks from responsibilities for our mental health. We do. We can't just be go, 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 go all the time. And let me tell you, I try. I'm very busy. I'm always doing something for my business, for my household, for my son. I'm always doing something because the to-do list never ends. And also, when you can take a minute to say that what you want is more important than your to-do list, which will probably feel a little rebellious if you've been functioning in this mode for a long time. Oh, that is so beneficial. Like I'm trying to think about with this skill and some of the other DBT skills and the benefits you get out of it. I'm trying to think of like what other skill provides as much benefit as this one does for these areas that I'm talking about. And I'm struggling to think mm. of one. I really That's am. Fair. Because this skill has, I, of course, this skill is distinct and it's different from other DBT skills, but it really does. When I say I'm not going to do what's expected of me, I'm going to do what I want, yeah. then I free myself. And it honestly, it like bolsters me up and fills my cup a little bit to then return mm -hmm. to the things that do need to get done when I do get back to my to-do list. So this skill is really important and you need it more if you're like me <laughs> but I love that we have such wildly different experiences here where Kate you're like this is like breathing to me right like I, <laughs> I'm the epitome of this skill and me I'm like oh my god this skill feels crazy uncomfortable most of the time and we're gonna yeah. have listeners no, in I both love of that and I like hearing about like rebellious teenage you that, yeah, like, you did not know me at that time in my had. life. No. Oh, there's more I could tell you. Driving but, around yeah. Seattle would not have been on my bingo card for things you'd done in your past. So yeah. That makes, that makes me well, happy. Well, what we were doing, I'll tell you how it happened. Why am I talking about this on the podcast for everybody listening? But here you go. A fun sneak peek into Michelle's rebellious stage. So we were playing a game, which I think it goes by many names, but we called it Fuck Me Hard. <laughs> <laughs> and what you did was anytime you saw a car with a headlight out, ah. anybody in the car, you had to hit the ceiling, the roof ceiling of the car. Yeah. And the last person to hit the ceiling had to take off an article of clothing. Ah. And so we'd hit the ceiling, we'd say, fuck me hard. And then the last person to do it had to take off a piece of clothing. And this is how we eventually wound up naked driving around Seattle. <laughs> so there you go now now everybody listening is gonna think of that the next time they see a car without a headlight <laughs> oh I that's the so. story <laughs> it didn't just happen it wasn't just like huh i'm gonna drive around naked in seattle today it evolves that's that sure. way that's fair public nudity is often an a, a spontaneous thing <laughs> <laughs> for you yes sorry that just makes me that makes me so happy. Um, <laughs> <coughs> sorry, guys. Ah, I'm so tired of being sack. Um, all right, so tips and tricks, sort of. Uh, tips, at least. Maybe not tricks. I don't know if it's tricks. <laughs> um, so my first suggestion for a way slash maybe time to do this is, like, specifically around work. Specifically if you're experiencing, like, burnout. Um I think that this is one that probably I, I would be so excited to hear about Michelle doing this for an entire day, um, which is just to play hooky, right? Get a migraine like I used to. Right? Quote, unquote. Um, but, uh, yes, migraine. exactly. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Air quotes migraine. Right. And just like and do it. Do it spontaneously. Wake up one day. And when you have one of those days where you think I just don't fucking want to today. Give yourself the gift of don't. Don't do it call out sick and then do your best to do nothing but things you want to do for the entire day as few responsibilities and obligations as you can possibly do right like if you're a pet owner you still have to feed your pets right like there's some things we can't get away from but to the bare bones essentials otherwise just do things you want to do right fucking off capitalism fucking off the workplace fucking off for you right 
doing that act of rebellion, I think, is a wonderful gift to give people. Um, if I, you know, when we uh, progress to being a society where we can call in and say, I need a mental health day, then you won't have to have quote unquote migraines anymore. But, uh, you know, so long as it's still not considered it acceptable to call in for a mental health day, uh, I say we're allowed to have migraines. Um, so that's my <clears throat> first <laughs> idea for it. Um, one thing I was thinking of, uh, specifically, uh, closest probably, uh, to the intended purpose of this skill, uh, with regards to addiction is, uh, utilizing it for myself, uh, when I'm feeling the urge to self-harm. And I would say that it can be especially f effective, fulfilling, somewhere in there, uh, to do something f to change your physical appearance as a way to have an alternate rebellion to, um, to self-harm. I, I can talk. Um, <laughs> uh, right. So shaving your head, getting piercings, dyeing your hair, getting a little flash tattoo, right. Um, wildly different clothing than you normally wear, wildly different makeup, um, right. Doing something that really alters your appearance can have a similarly <clears throat> sort of physical, visceral, uh, tint to it. Cause right. Cause I, you know, like for instance, the playing hooky, that might be an alternate rebellion to doing something more harmful to yourself. Like for instance, not just driving yourself into burnout. Um, and, or maybe you like would turn to something like substance use or self-harm or something else less healthy to get yourself through that work day. Right. So instead, uh, of rebelling in that fashion, like, well, I, I'll be at work, but I'm going to be drunk while I'm doing it. Right. Like instead you can just tell work to fuck off. Um, and then for folks who might struggle with figuring out ways to do little acts of rebellion, I would invite you to think about things that you stopped doing because you grew up. Uh, some examples I can think of off the top of my head, though there are probably hundreds more, uh, are things like jumping in mud puddles, uh, playing on playground equipment, coloring, playing with dolls, playing with toys in the bath, Dressing in a superhero costume to go out to dinner or to the movies, right? You all, you've all seen those kids, right? You get, and they're like, doesn't matter, they're wearing a tutu and a Spider-Man costume. It's the best <laughs> thing ever, right? Like a magic wand. It's the best thing ever, right? And they are so unselfconscious. They are having total fun in their little act of rebellion. And you can too. And so, right? Doing things that are, so, you know considered age inappropriate but in a silly way right like why 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 would you not jump in mud puddles jumping in mud puddles is fun that's why we did it because mm -hmm. it was fun all right uh, so turn to childhood if you need a place to find some inspiration for ways to act rebellious that are probably not harmful since they mm. were things somebody supervising you thought it was okay for you to do as a child <laughs> so those are those are my ideas yeah. I'll build off of that last one there that you were talking about with one that I wrote down, which is that I like the way that you're thinking of it, which is return to some of those things that you once did as a child yeah. and now do those things as an adult. I really like that way of looking at it. I was thinking of something similar, but also knowing that if people were maybe raised like me, I mean, mm. I, I'm sure I did jump in a mud puddle a time or two. I don't know if I did with my mother's encouragement necessarily, but there may be some things from childhood that you never did uh, yeah. that you wanted to do as a kid. You were like, God, I really wanted to do that thing that, you know, another kid in your class was doing, but your parents wouldn't let you. Well, now's your time. <laughs> you don't have anybody stopping you. Um, and also too, I think if you grew up similarly to me as well, where like there were just a lot of rules for things. Like, for example, this is going to sound ridiculous, but it's true. Um, in my household, there was a right way to fold towels. Um, and I see those things sometimes on Facebook, like those little memes where it's like, what's the right way to fold the towel, A, B, or C, or whatever. And some people feel very righteous about this, right? You know, there was a right way to put on the toilet paper, on the, on the, right. There, there was just a right and a wrong, quote unquote, way to do everything in my household. And if I didn't do things the right way, another way, in other words, um, my mom's way, I was told to fix it and do it the way that 
that she thought it should be done. So chances are probably some of those things have maybe translated and stuck with you into adulthood. And if you recognize that where you're like, huh, I recognize I've done this thing always this way because I was told as a child that that was basically the only way to do it. And that was the right way to do it. Take a chance and try doing it differently because there are many, many, many (laughs) right ways to do something we could say. So try folding those towels differently <laughs> as, one, as one example to go with. Um, you know, put things in different places in your house. Try to really recognize what the programming is that you got from your childhood and shift it so that you're proving to yourself that things can be done differently and it's okay. Um The other suggestions I have also going with the theme of childhood, and I was thinking specifically about people who are parents and have kids of their own, or um, even if you're not a parent, if you're just around children on a regular basis, whether that's like nieces or nephews, or I don't know, maybe you're a nanny or whatever it is. If you have kids in your life, show them it's okay to go outside the box. Um, I recognize already with my son being 18 months old there are times where I'm like (laughs) you know like I know that there would be this part of me that's like I don't want him to walk outside barefoot because again look at how I was raised but there's another bigger part of me that's like Michelle you get to kind of do this again act of alternate rebellion by letting him get to have these experiences that you didn't get to have and proving to yourself that it's okay like I mentioned the licking the cookie dough off the spoon earlier. My husband and I have already joked many times because I do do that now as an adult and I relish it every time. But that, yes, we are definitely going to let Noah lick the cookie dough off the spoon kind of a thing. But yeah, let your kids make a mess. Let And it, I understand again now being a parent myself, there's not always going to be the right time and place for this. But try to find opportunities where it's like, hey... Today, we don't have any place to be after this. Like, they're already going to get a bath tonight. Whatever. They want to roll in the grass. They want to do <laughs> They want to do whatever. I'm going to I'm going to be okay with that. Um and not just be okay with them doing it. Join them. That's the next level up. Like you were saying, Kate, I thought of this when you were talking about jumping in the mud puddles. Right? Don't just be like, "Yeah, you can go play in the mud puddles, kiddo." Go do it with them. Step outside that box with them. And do those things that you didn't do as a kid. And yes, is it going to be, again, I see it now as an adult where I'm like, oh my God, that's so much work to clean up and that kind of a thing. But it's worth it. It's worth it to have the memories. It's worth it for your kids to have that sensory experience. It's worth it for them to have a smaller list of rules than you grew up with. Because that's my goal as a parent. I don't want Noah to have as many rules in his head as I did. There were rules for everything. I want, yeah, there are going to, of course, be rules for some things, but I want it to be for the things that really matter, like safety. Um, And I want him to have less rules. So, yeah, that was something that I just said. So, yeah, but that felt important to name for those of you who have kids in your life is to engage in acts of rebellion with them. And kids are great teachers. They will find it all day long and all you have to do is follow their lead. So, That was one. Um, And then the final thing that I'll say, because Kate mentioned initially, play hooky for a whole day. Do it randomly. And again, I'll be honest, Kate, even when I heard you say that and I envisioned myself doing it and my whole self was just like, nope, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. (laughs) So if you're like me and if you're like, oh, the thought of playing hooky sounds like a stretch, Here's what's probably much, much less of a stretch is to put off something on your to-do list by at least five minutes, at least. When you're about to get up and go do the dishes, tell yourself, no, I'm going to do the dishes after I do blank and have that fill in the blank be something for you. Again, the same way that I was just talking about with the kids thing. There, You're not going to be able to, you know, do chaos all the time same thing here you may have days where you're like 
I really can't put this off. Or again, do we want it to necessarily be that you are doing this with everything day in and day out? No. But if you're like me and you're rarely, if ever, doing this, try it at like, I would say at least once a day to just try to put something off for at least five minutes to take a couple minutes for yourself to do something for you, to finish that show that you didn't have time to finish earlier, to, I don't know, dance around your living room, which will probably feel like an act of rebellion, to do whatever it is that you want to do for you. Um, Try that if the playing hooky feels like too much of a stretch. Though, I love Kate's suggestion. I just know I'm not ready (laughs) for it. So this is what I feel ready for. And so that's what I'll suggest to all of you too. No, I love that. Right. To each their own and their level of comfort. Yeah, um, exactly. I will admit the playing hooky for an entire day got a lot harder once it had to be me individually reaching out to each of my clients to cancel stuff. That's a whole nother. That's a whole nother proposition. Than it's just hard calling when you're sick from an agency. Yeah, it is. I want to I'll acknowledge that. And I say I've definitely never done it. I wouldn't want to say that, but it's a much higher bar now before I would (laughs) consider doing that. Um, Well, before uh, we do something really different and Michelle launches into a closing moment because I (laughs) will probably cough in the middle of it if I try and do it. So I want to give you guys a more peaceful send out than I can give today. Uh, Before that, I wanted to talk a little bit about an event that we have going next month. Uh, If you guys have been listening, you heard us talk about this last month with the Coffee Hour group that we are starting. So that is the first Monday of every month from 4 to 5 p.m. And we're going to be walking folks. Pacific Standard Time. That's true. Anytime. No, no. That's why you're (laughs) listening. 4 to 5 p.m. in what time zone? It's time zone roulette. (laughs) Who knows? No, no, thank you for interrupting. That's an entirely important piece of detail. <laughs> 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, cost is 25 bucks. Uh, if you can't attend live because you are, say, I don't know, in Europe, uh, and that is the middle of the goddamn night for you, uh, anybody who pays for a ticket does get the replay sent to them the next day. So you'd have access to all the same information. Uh, what they, the groups look like is the first half is really Michelle and I sharing information. Uh, And then the second half is open for Q&As on the topic. So uh, what we're looking at this month is uh, starting a group from scratch, right? You have Mm -hmm. nothing but the intention. (laughs) You have a dream and nothing more, Uh, right? And so what do you do then? So some of the topics that we're going to be talking about are how much to charge and how to collect payment, uh, how to screen clients to make sure they're a good fit for your group and your group is a good fit for them. Uh, how to handle selecting and disseminating the handouts that you want to utilize for your group uh, and how to structure the group itself, Uh, right? So once people get in the door and you actually want to start leading them, what might that look like? So there'll be a different topic every month. We'll definitely be announcing them right in the Facebook group and in the Mm -hmm. podcast here. But uh, yeah, it was fun to see folks last time and we hope to see a bunch more faces in June because yeah, the first Monday of the month is the 5th. Yes. Uh, uh, next month. So June 5th, 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 25 <laughs> bucks. Listen to us yak about starting a group from scratch and get your questions answered also. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you can write to us with questions if you're someone who can't attend live, right? And still want your questions answered. So, yeah. So, yeah. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. We each said it at least once. Okay, it's closing moment time. Okay, so get settled in and comfortable wherever you are. I would even encourage you, because this closing moment is going to be about alternate rebellion, maybe there's something you want to do to get comfortable. Maybe you want to lay down or maybe... You want to grab a stuffed animal. Maybe you want to just change the way your body is positioned in some way. Do whatever you need to do to fully sink into this closing moment. Even if you worry, it might be a little 
ridiculous or outside the box what you need. But once you're settled in, let your mind start to wander to a time from your past when you can look back and realize that you did this skill the way that Kate and I were reflecting on times of our life earlier. This may be a time when you were a child and did something that you knew the adults in your life wouldn't approve of. Maybe this was a time from your adolescence, like I was speaking about. Or maybe this time is more recent from your adulthood years. Maybe this is just a time from a couple weeks ago. And you can look back and think, oh, I did rebel a little bit. Just bring that time and that memory to mind. And imagine yourself back there. And as you do that, as you see that memory playing out before you, start to shift your attention to the neck down and notice what you feel physically in your body. Maybe you feel butterflies in your stomach, that nervous feeling in your gut. Maybe you feel tingly, super alive, a thrill going through you as you do this thing. Whatever it is, really notice fully the physical sensations that came when you did this act of alternate rebellion and pay full attention to your body and what it's experiencing. And as you continue to pay attention to the sensations in your body, begin to let this memory go and instead let your mind start to think about something in your present life or something that's coming up in the future where you can imagine yourself starting to engage in a new act of alternate rebellion. Imagining yourself experiencing these same sensations in your body and watch it playing out before you for how you can start bringing this skill into your life now. Maybe that looks like what Kate was talking about and you imagine yourself playing hooky for the day. Maybe it looks like what I talked about you imagine yourself doing something intentionally wrong or backwards from how you were taught to do it. Whatever it is, this is your time to really imagine yourself doing that thing and imagining how that can feel for you physically to let yourself be free. Imagining all the ways that this could benefit your mental health. Perhaps setting an intention to act on this soon in your life 
to take this beyond just imagination here in this closing moment and to turn it into action and reality. And now, whenever you're ready, you can start bringing some gentle movement back into your body and letting these images fade away. <clears throat> Starting to move more and coming back to the space that you're in and opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. To learn more about us and the DBT skills we're teaching each week, join our Facebook group. Simply log in to your Facebook profile and search for DBT and Me Podcast.